So Anshal Mina is uh, an American technologist, researcher, and artist. And it's actually that blend of her experience um, that actually she brings to her analysis of memes and culture. Um, and she is serving as the contributing editor for the book Ai Weiwei, Spatial Matters. Her own work has been exhibited in museums and galleries across the US and around the world. Her writings have appeared in places like The Atlantic, Wired, New Inquiry, the LA Review of Books, Al Jazeera English, and Hyperallergic. Um, a 2016-2017 research fellow at Berkman, um, at Berkman Klein uh, at Harvard, and a uh, product director at the te technology company Median. Um, her home, frankly, is wherever Wi-Fi is. In fact, I have found a lot of times that I actually have no clue where she lives. And I write to her, and she's off somewhere, and maybe we converge, and maybe not. Please take a moment with the finger snaps and the, and the, and the jazz hands to please welcome on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dana. Is, is the microphone working? Everyone hearing clearly? Great. Um, I love that we're snapping because, uh, um, you know, I, when I was living in New York, um, I, I started my creative career um, doing poetry and art performances. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of the, our engagement with folks was, uh, was through snapping. Um, and, um, and, uh, but first of all, I just want to thank Dana. I just want to thank Data and Society for, for having me here. This is literally my first uh, talk about the book. The book was just launched yesterday. And so I'm super honored that this is um, uh, the first, first place where I can, I can talk about some of these ideas and talk about uh, the book. Um, and, um, and really, I owe a huge amount of thanks to Data and Society and the community, um, especially the Media Manipulation Group, um, for, um, for the conversations, the engagements over the f past few years. Um, a number of uh, folks in the room um, I've also had many conversations with as well. Well, and so, um, uh, so this work is very much a reflection of, of uh, many people, um, and it's just being um, channeled into, um, into a single book. Um, and there's another important qualification that I want to um, highlight, um, um, you know, in addition to um, kind of the, my work as a technologist, as an artist, as a, you know, having done poetry, is that I grew up with cats. Um, and importantly, I grew up with cats before the internet really took hold. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I, I love taking pictures of my cats using my camera. I had this big SLR and would take pictures and, um, you know, and then it would take some time to you know, develop it first. You know, I had to develop the film um, and then put it online. Um, and so much has changed since then. I think we're kind of over, over you know, the internet is overflowing with cats now. Um, we have, um, you know, these celebrity cats. Um, and it just take a moment to remember that there, there was a time when we didn't have these, um, these silly creatures um, as celebrities. Well, we had Heathcliff, we had Garfield, but they were associated with kind of mischief, neuroticism. But instead, these creatures are kind of heroic, right? They're, they're kind of celebrated. Um, and um, it's, this is what I explore in the first chapter of my book, um, because it's in looking at kind of this archetypal meme that we can start to understand how meme culture works in general on the internet. Um, so I want to make an argument here that cats were actually marginalized media. Um, in the 15th century, Pope Innocent VIII um, issued a decree that put the Vatican's official stamp on cat hatred. Um, as part of witch hunts, cats were literally the, uh, the first and perhaps only animals who were part of um, experienced religious persecution. Um, they are associated with women and with femininity. Um, and witch finders would insist anyone owning a cat must automatically be a witch. Those cultural attitudes in the West continue to today um, uh, until recently, I would say, um, with this idea that cats were kind of strange and kind of weird, weird creatures. This is not limited to the West. Um, uh, how many of you know your Chinese zodiac animal? I mean, a number of you, great. So none of you are cats. Maybe some of you are dogs. It's the year of the pig coming up. Um, the legend, as legend goes, uh, the ox and the rat were, and the cat, the cat and the rat were riding on the ox, um, were crossing the river to be chosen as part of the, the 12 zodiac animals, and the rat pushed the cat off, um, and the cat, cat was gone. Um, and so it was literally marginalized um, in this story. And in the broadcast era, the animal that was kind of prototypical um, was the dog. Um, you had Lassie, you had Old Yeller, you had Balto over here in Central Park, associated with man's best friend. Um, it was kind of disciplined, it was you know, kind of loyal, a, a little authoritarian, like listening to what you do, not, you know, it comes when you called. Um, and so it kind of represented in many ways the, the values of, of kind of broadcast society. Um, and this is not just a kind of, what's interesting is actually looking at the numbers here, Daniel Engber had this uh, interesting article in Slate, that canines held the, the, the lion's share of search results by, on Amazon for a healthy two to one. And then he went into Google Books and found that um, twice as many pups than cats 
Um, and you know, this is not conclusive numbers, but it's interesting that you know, numerically and culturally, dogs just had this kind of dominant place in society. And when you think about it, dogs are public creatures, right? Dogs, you go to dog parks, you walk your dog, you have dog shows, whereas cats were private. Before the internet, um, it was very hard to know who actually had cats. Um, it, took, it took a lot of effort to, to project the fact that you had cats, that, that your neighbors had cats. Um, they were much more private. But something changed. Um, and part of what changed was, was technology, right? The internet, smartphones, the ability to broadcast that which was private um, and place that into a broader discourse um, turned what one BuzzFeed writer called the internet into the, the world's cat park. Um, and suddenly what was private, um, and this is the first chapter I call the revolution of the cat. Media at the margins, cats, moved closer to the center. But importantly, it was revealing what in so many ways was already there to begin with. It wasn't that cats suddenly appeared, it was they were always there. Um, and it was through this kind of network society, through technology, um, that we, we have this kind of new relationship with cats now in popular culture. This has political implications. Um, Ethan Zuckerman uh, wrote um, about the cute cat theory of digital activism. And he pointed out that Web 1.0, the kind of internet designed by Tim Berners-Lee, was intended to let physicists share research findings online. It was an informational internet. Um, but with the emergence of Web 2.0, it became, the internet became a space for creating and disseminating amateur content. So as he says, it's in other words, it was dis for disseminating cute pictures of cats. And as the theory goes, the reason this is relevant to activism was, um, was a very serious one, um, is that when you try to censor the internet, if you are trying to censor activist messages, um, you, are, you um, inevitably will then censor the, the same internet that, um, that is being used to spread um, kind of amateur media, the things that bring people joy, and then inevitably then um, upset more people than you originally intended. Um, and so that was part of the cute cat theory, that an internet that is designed for disseminating cute cats is just as effective for disseminating activist messages. And I responded to this that um, in the Chinese context, there's this kind of Chinese corollary, because in China, there's a much more precise method of censorship than simply shutting down the internet. Um, you can search for keywords. You can censor by images. There's humans. There's AIs. There's different algorithms for detecting content. And so, the dynamic that that created was that people had to embed, um, and I'll show an example of this, activist messages within the cute cat, literally within cute animals, um, as a way to skirt internet censorship. And so I wrote that with Chinese political memes, the cute cats are the activist message. But what's interesting over the past few years is that this is happening regardless um, of whether you're living in a censored environment. And indeed, the distance between the very silly and the very serious is actually quite blurry. Cats Against Brexit was a major hashtag that popped up uh, right before Brexit. Um, literally, it's just posting your cat and saying you stood against Brexit. There was cats for Brexit, of course, um, but numerically, I think Cats Against Brexit won out. And, um, and again, to the point of dogs being in public space, uh, immediately afterward, there was dogs, hashtag dogs at polling stations. In Mexico, there was Candigato Moris, um, and who would say, I am a cat, I don't do much. But um, if you vote for me, you can get the rats out of office. Um, and so again, a political message. And this is the Cao Nima. This is the grass mud horse in China. Um, it was a, it was a, um, a profane pun. Um, it sounds uh, a lot like uh, the word in Chinese for fuck your mother. Um, and it's a sh is short for fuck internet censorship. And so this is the example of literally the cute cat um, being used to skirt censorship and then, um, and then curse out internet censorship at the same time. A uh, former Data and Society fellow has written about this, uh, Zara Rahman, the goats of Bangladesh. Um, and uh, um, it's modeled after humans of New York, and it's literally goats um, in Bangladesh uh, talking about politics and society and going between the very serious and the very silly um, all in one single feed. So in looking at these silly examples of internet memes, and I'm going to talk about more serious ones um, in a minute, um, and, but really the theme of my book is asking um, and talking about what do memes what role do they play in society and in politics? And what kind of frameworks um, can we bring? Um, and what questions can we start asking about memes um, to understand um, the kind of impact they're having? Um, and so before I do that, um, let's talk about what memes are. Um, Limor Schiffman, um, who uh, wrote one of the seminal texts on, on memes, has defined memes in this way. It's very um, academic and very, uh, we could critique this definition, but I find it useful. It's, it's A, you have a group of digital items that share common characteristics of content form or stance. Um, so if you have a, a long cat and someone else has a long cat, 
um, uh, those cats might look different, but they have this kind of commonality that they're, they're very long. Um, and they're created with awareness of each other. It's not accidental. Um, the long cat meme, um, people who make those are aware of each other. It's kind of a social experience. And then C, importantly, they're circulated, imitated, transformed via the internet by multiple users. And it's that, that notion of transformation that I think is really important to understanding meme culture and its role in society. I interviewed Amanda Brennan, who uh, has the best job title um, in the world, Tumblr librarian. Um, and her definition of memes is um, shorter. It's just pieces of content that travel from person to person and change along the way. And I like this definition because it emphasizes people. Um, we have this language that says something went viral, right? Um, but it is people who make things go viral, who make things go mimetic. Um, and, um, and then it's that change. The fact that people change it means that they're imbuing it with a little bit of themselves or cultural values, um, that these are, co these are objects that are co-created and these are cultural experiences. Kate Milter, um, at the time um, she did her master's at the London School of Economics, um, studied law cats, uh, literal law cat culture. Um, and one of her conclusions was, was really that the reason people share and create um, is often means to the same end. It's about making meaningful connections with others. It's about this notion of community, that people are building community. Um, lolcat grammar is a real grammar, um, and it's a real culture, um, and it's worth studying. And so in the book I talk, um, I dive into this a little bit more, but um, one of my concerns with uh, how we th have thought about the internet is still that kind of web 1.0 framing, the information superhighway. Um, but in so many ways, the things that we look at on the internet, the, especially memes, but in many other aspects of internet culture, are about affirmation, about political beliefs, identities, culture. It's more like an affirmation um, superhighway. And so I'm interested in, in what that means and what those implications are. In the book, I look at this in many different ways. I look at the form of memes, so the kind of, the, you know, literally, what, what do they look like? How can we treat these as, like, as visual objects? I look at the feels, the emotions, attention economics, narrative, power, culture, and contention. I look at this concept of a digital plaza, which I'll talk about in history. Um, and today, I'm just going to talk about a few of these things. Um, but in the book, I, I'm in, in discussion. I'm happy to talk about the others. Um, but uh, kind of poke around at these different aspects of memes. And specifically in the context of activism and media, um, but given my work in journalism as well, um, I, I, I do look at this through, through the lens of misinformation. When I was pitching the book, um, one of the, the big questions that I got from people was, well, what is, it, what is the point of studying all this? It's very ephemeral. Um, you have cats against Brexit. It comes and it goes. Um, these images kind of pop up. They kind of disappear. Um, and that's true to a certain extent. I think meme culture is very fast, right? I think we, we're all aware of this. And things um, can be very ephemeral. But at the same time, um, I became very interested after looking at these for over the number of years that some memes seem to just hold. They seem to stick in society. And they seem to just come back in different manifestations and remixes. And the opening story in my book, I actually look at two ones from the summer of 2014. Um, I'm sure many of us remember that summer. That was the summer that hashtag Black Lives Matter um, entered United States discourse. But in Hong Kong and in China and Asia, more generally, hashtag umbrella movement also entered international discourse. And they had a number of common characteristics. Both of them used hands up uh, symbology. Both of them used hashtags. Many of them used gathering in physical space and using chants that were that blended both hashtags and, um, and actual, like, actual chanting. Um, many of them use selfie culture. And so it's in looking at these um, and seeing the kind of the long-term effects, what, what's happened since 2014, that um, it's, um, you start looking at some of meme, meme dynamics today. But before I go into that, I think it's, been, it's just been an interesting week. Um, it's been a, um, a number of memes, and I think so much has changed, even since summer of 2014, about memes and politics, because it is no longer about just activists. It is about people in power who are utilizing them. Everyone from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, you know, dancing um, and re-co-opting memes. Um, you have Donald Trump um, using uh, a Game of Thrones memes. Um, and then you have the Internet Research Agency, Russian propagandists, um, recent reports showing that so much of their content took mimetic form. And so the discourse has changed. And so a lot of what they try to do in the book is not try to keep up with anything, because I submitted the manuscript, what, a year and a half ago, but instead look at larger principles, larger ways of understanding. And one of them, I think, is narrative. Um, I think we th often think about memes as charismatic objects that get a lot of attention and that kind of flash in the pan moments. But many memes actually build narratives and inject narratives and cultural values into the larger discourse, for better or for worse. 
just looking at number of the Democrats who um, entered the House this year, um, the, the narratives that they brought were using hashtag and meme culture. Um, Deb Holland um, was referencing hashtag MMIW, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, which was a um, hashtag and mimetic movement um, um, started with indigenous communities in the United States um, around um, missing and murdered women. Um, you had the year of the woman narrative that appeared and very much drawing from the discourse, obviously from historic years of the woman, but also from the women's march, the, the idea that, that women were, were the woman's place belong, a woman's place is in the house. Um, and then Speaker Pelosi um, kind of ate it um, because she spoke about Black Lives Matter. She was asked about Black Lives Matter. And she said, I support the recognition that Black Lives Matter. And remember, Black Lives Matter started as a hashtag. Um, and I've incorporated many of my statesons. And then she said, all lives matter. And that, of course, um, triggered a, a huge response. Uh, journalist Therese said he was extremely disappointed um, and um, because uh, the phrase hashtag all lives matter had been a co-optation of Black Lives Matter and was part of the kind of the narrative response. Um, but these are long running narratives. These are long running discourses that Pelosi was responding to whose origins were um, arguably through hashtag and meme culture. And indeed, Black Lives Matter was not accidental. Um, I think what's important, and again, things do not automatically go viral. There is intent behind it. Alicia Garza, at the beginning of a kind of broader national discourse around this, wrote a history of the Black Lives Matter movement. And she addressed this. She literally addressed All Lives Matter, I think, before even that hashtag had took on, taken on. She said, Black Lives Matter doesn't mean your life is not important. It means that black lives, which are seen as without value within white supremacy, are important to your liberation. And so that history, that narrative, um, was behind the, the kind of smaller hashtag, um, but was part of the larger discourse. Francesca Poletta um, has written about this um, in, in regards to plot um, in, 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 in social movements. And it's something that um, I think we need to be paying more attention to because narrative is, is the frame through which we uh, interpret and understand events. Um, and she writes that it's, this is plot is the logic that makes meaningful the events that precede the story's conclusion. It's how we interpret the things around us. Um, and uh, um, without plot, events would just be occurrences. They'd be discontinuous and separate moments rather than episodes in an unfolding story. Um, and so the, some of the most effective movements, when you think about um, the Umbrella Movement's big chant, was um, uh, I want true universal suffrage. Um, you have ha the chant Black Lives Matter. Um, all of these chants, um, these hashtags, are injecting a narrative, a framework, through which to see potentially disparate events. And indeed, the word story, um, the most effective mimetic narratives um, are those that draw from history. The word story in English draws from the word, lat from, obviously from the word um, in Latin, historia. Um, and, um, and just another kind of weird cross-cultural um, kind of parallel, um, in Chinese, uh, the word gu shi, which means um, story also, is a literally an old thing, an old practice. And when you think about the biggest meme um, over the past few years has been make America great again. Um, hashtag MAGA um, has many kinds of variations. People remixed it, make America Mexico again, make America native again, make America green again. Um, I saw one just down the street, make America goth again. Um, this is a story, though, about the United States. It draws from the history of Reaganism, and the history of Reaganism draws from um, the past of the United States, projects um, some sort of greatness um, that was in the past. Um, and the Tea Party movement also was, again, drawing a story, telling a story about that movement that connected directly with the beginnings of the United States. The Black Lives Matter movement was doing this in physical space. Uh, two, two protests that I documented. Um, one was in Oakland at the Alameda Courthouse, where historically, um, uh, where um, Huey Newton was held on trial. Um, and then um, at the St. Louis Courthouse um, in, in St. Louis, um, where um, the Dred Scott um, uh, cases uh, began um, and where slaves were sold on the front steps. This was a deliberate, these were deliberate actions. These were deliberate ways, both um, on both the left and the right, to draw from American history and tell a larger story that combined hashtag culture, meme culture, and also kind of physical gathering and physical space. And so I don't look at memes just as digital objects or just as these things that are ephemeral, but how they interact and intersect with larger media discourses. Sasha Costanza Chalk has written about this with regards to the immigration justice movement in the United States, but I think it applies to most social movements today. Social movements are becoming transmedia hubs. Um, so they're both digital and physical. There are posters, there are selfies, there are signs, there are tattoos, um, there are stencils. And they're shared, aggregated, remixed, and circulated ever more, more widely across platforms. And we're seeing this more and more um, today. But that ephemerality, um, I think people had a point when they're asking about that, because memes, again, they're never stable. Um, 
Marley Vincent Lindsay has written about this, that networks of memes, they never reach a moment of stability. Um, there's always some kind of change. And I think the Pelosi story is, an, is a good example, but um, there are also other darker remixes of hashtag Black Lives Matter. At the Unite the Right rally, just as I was finishing the book, um, one of the big chants was, of course, white lives matter. Um, that remix culture can be repurposed to shape narratives. And so when we think about the role of attention in social movements, social movements, their big role is to draw attention to an issue. Um, but the other thing that they contribute is a narrative, a framework. And so you have different frameworks in which to see different events in American society. And so I talk about that, the clapback, um, clapback culture in meme culture, how that plays out in larger discourse. It is not just about the little remixes of hashtags, but that how that echoes into larger discourse, into media discourse, into um, the halls of power. And Harley Hochschild, the sociologist, has written about this, this, this concept. It's, it's more than just the story, the, the briefer story. She writes about this concept of the deep story. It's this deep story that is the narrative through which we see the country, through which we see ourselves, through which we see the world. Do we see the, the country as a, inherently a fair place um, where we um, will be rewarded? Is this a meritocracy? Is it a country where um, there is um, you know, tremendous injustices? What is the narrative that we carry? And she emphasizes this feeling, that it's a feeling. It's more than just a story. Um, and, it's a, and the deep story is a feels as if it's true story, stripped of facts and judgments. And so much of meme culture is speaking to those deeper stories, um, framing them um, in the temporary and in the co contemporary. Um, but they speak to deeper stories in society. Um, and you see that globally. Um, and Whitney Phillips, um, uh, who I believe was a fellow here, um, and associated with the, with the society, data and society, um, I love this framework that she brings. Is, um, is this notion of folklore, um, that um, the reason she emphasizes folkloric content um, is that we shouldn't just be focused just on the veracity of content, uh, whether it's true or false, is that we're f we need to focus on a, a beginning and ending with participation. Um, that meme culture, again, um, is about that, um, that larger participation, that culture of discourse. And so back to this summer of 2014, um, the book, in the book I look at meme culture in a global context um, uh, because I think it's very interesting, one, because you have different political contexts, but also literally different internets um, and, and different ways that internets play out. And so you can start to see that push and pull of meme culture, which I think of as like the street art of the internet, with what I think of as these digital streets. Um, and the digital streets, as we all know, have different politics. Um, and uh, in China, um, the way that the, the umbrella movement played out um, is, is another instructive example. So in Hong Kong, as we know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more, um, uh, it's, um, China has, it's a PRC territory, um, but it's a one country, two system um, system where Hong Kong has ostensibly greater freedoms, freedom of assembly, um, there's a free press. And so the ability to physically gather in Hong Kong is a unique one um, in the PRC. Um, and so, but, the, but there's still limitations. Beijing does have an influence on daily society. And as that influence was growing, um, the umbrella movement emerged. Um, and um, the, the umbrella um, came to be a symbol for um, the chant, which was, I want true universal suffrage. Um, and people gathered in physical space, created the yellow umbrella. Um, and the umbrella itself had this kind of symbolic resonance because people were using it to resist pepper spray um, in, um, uh, when police were trying to break up the initial protests. Um, that's the really, really short inversion. But um, what I'm emphasizing here is that you also had the memes. You can see back here, keep calm um, and be alert, um, utilizing meme culture. Um, the yellow umbrella itself became a meme, the color yellow. But it also, this movement also was drawing on long histories, um, was drawing from the color yellow, the role of yellow in um, the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Um, and so that's why the umbrella in particular was yellow. And that's, um, people were wear wearing yellow ribbons um, long before the umbrella took hold as a symbol. But the story of how this, um, how this particular movement played out is an example of, of, um, of how public space um, is inherently political. Um, that, that power and politics um, play out um, with the way we, we, we um, engage with memes on the internet. The narrative that emerged as the movement was beginning was that there might be this Tiananmen-style massacre, um, that the PRC might bring in tanks um, and, and shut down the protests. But I think looking at what happens, um, it, what happened afterward, um, there were no tanks, as we know. But instead, um, was, uh, was a very sophisticated effort to dampen the narrative, to dampen the power, um, and to show that you don't need tanks as much um, to, to limit movements if you can control um, a lot of the narrative discourse and um, the, the legal and physical space. 
So one of the memes that emerged, um, Xi Jinping, um, president of China, was holding an umbrella once. And so people, of course, had to Photoshop that and turned it into this yellow umbrella. Um, and that, of course, went viral. Um, and, uh, but um, uh, the way that he responded um, well, immediately was uh, uh, when he went to places like Macau, um, he would ban umbrellas all around him. He had, he had that ability. Um, uh, but then over the years, the, the umbrella increasingly became more stigmatized. And by the time he visited in 2017, all protest slogans and symbols related to the movement were removed around him. And so you had this gradual slide um, from, um, from the kind of, the, um, kind of um, harmless um, remix into, into complete stigmatization and a shutdown in a place where, in a, in, in a territory where ostensibly there should be free expression. And one of the big concerns um, was that this would actually spread into mainland China, that this movement energy would spread into mainland China. And, um, and so, um, as we know, that the mainland China um, censors its internet. Um, and, but it doesn't just censor. And I think there's interesting research here on how the Hong Kong protests actually played out on Sina Weibo. It wasn't just that the umbrellas were, were, um, were censored. It wasn't just that messages were censored. Is that um, um, in addition to deletion, um, researchers found that um, the government actually um, encouraged reposts of anti-Occupy messages, um, anti-Occupy um, Hong Kong messages. Um, and so there were 11,000 reposts for anti-Occupy posts versus around 600 that were um, related, just neutrally related to the protests. And so again, you see this attempts at narrative, shifting the narrative, that it turned out that ability to control the internet infrastructure helped dampen um, the narrative that, that could have spread in mainland, mainland China and neutralized any other images that might have been missed by censorship, by um, painting the story of, of the democracy movement in the Hong Kong as one of chaos. And then in addition to that was a series of legal and, um, um, and physical actions um, in the public spaces, including disappearing booksellers, um, arresting uh, the leaders of, of the movement after all the attention had gone away, dampening the ability for the narrative to gain any more power. And so in the book, I, t um, I have a chapter called Bodies and Minds, um, that um, those who can control, you know, there's this saying from Bill Clinton that um, China will never control the internet. It's like nailing jello to the wall. Um, but what we're learning is that if you have enough nails, you can nail that jello. But even importantly, you can, you can grab the person who's trying to put that jello up in the first place. Um, and so if you can control people's bodies and their minds, um, you have a very sophisticated way of controlling both digital and physical public spaces. And this is a comic from uh, Jason Lee, um, who illustrated the book. Um, and uh, um, and he's, he's reflecting the words of, a, of uh, someone who wanted to become a lawyer in, in uh, Hong Kong. And she spoke about the growing stigma, the pressure on society um, that played out through the arts, all the art from the Hong Kong umbrella movement. Um, there's too much pressure on local arts organizations that all that art has to be hosted in London, even though ostensibly um, it should be um, allowed to be, to be kept in Hong Kong. In politics, you can't talk about democracy, this writer wrote. If you study Chinese, you can only write in simplified Chinese, which is the, the Chinese used in the mainland versus traditional Chinese. This is extreme despair, an extremely depressing condition. Um, you didn't need tanks um, if you can control all the enabling conditions of speech. Um, and I think that's one of, the, one of the themes in the book is that censorship is much more than deleting messages. It's about controlling the enabling conditions, um, what uh, Sean McDonald calls soft censorship. But the upside here is, in some ways, a proof of the power of these actions, of this art. Um, Gabriel Rockhill in LA Review of Books has written, the very act of censorship implies that censors believe in the political and social power of the arts, in these symbols, that they are dangerous. The clapback is a, is a direct response. It's a direct co-optation of something that the, uh, the opposition feels is powerful. And so um, in so many ways, when we're looking at um, uh, what is censored, we're looking at that which has the potential to be powerful. So again, it's, it's, it's very hard to, um, to, to write about memes in the book form um, uh, because things are changing so much. Um, and so I, I like to look to history as well and think about um, proto-memes or pre-internet memes. And I came across uh, these pins, um, these buttons, uh, the other day and um, wanted to like just zoom in on a few of them because these are memes before we called them uh, memes. Um, but show the role of symbologies and narratives um, during times of great contention, um, the nuclear disarmament movement, the AIDS crisis. The peace sign is, is a sign I think we, we all know. It's, a, it's an emoji, which is a, a sign of its kind of lasting power. 
Um, but it's a great example of a mashup. Um, it is the combination of uh, the semaphore flags um, for N and D um, to, to stand in for nuclear, the nuclear disarmament movement. And you can kind of see just in, this, just in these few buttons that I found um, that um, it was people were trying to figure out what is that symbol, what is that narrative um, of resistance to kind of the growing uh, awareness of, of, uh, of nuclear weapons. Um, was it going to be the, the mushroom cloud? Was it going to be the dove? And ultimately, society settled on the, um, um, on the peace sign. Um, but it was only through remix and through, meme, through kind of offline meme culture that it, that it took hold. This other pin I, I, I zoomed in on because um, it used the pink triangle, um, which I'm sure many of us know has its histories in, in Nazism in the concentration camps um, that were used to, um, uh, to flag people who were queer. Um, and they were subject to the worst abuse in the camps. But that um, ACT UP um, uh, changed that and flipped it, literally flipped it and, and co-opted it, remixed it, turned it into um, another narrative um, uh, that, um, that became a symbol of, of empowerment for um, especially the gay community, but the queer community at large. And Gilbert Baker didn't like that symbol because he felt it was too closely tied to Nazism. So he created another remix, another iteration of, of uh, queer symbology, um, and created the rainbow flag, um, and very intentionally so wanted it to be um, a new symbol, a new narrative. And we continue to see iterations of that, right? The, the Philadelphia um, uh, queer pride flag includes brown and black to more deliberately include um, communities of color. Um, and back to the midterms, um, Representative Wexton is now using the transgender flag, pink, blue, and white. Um, again, an iteration, a remix, um, a, a new symbol. And indeed, the, the peace sign, um, again, was this offline meme. Um, it became part of society, became a narrative, because people were willing to remix it. They thought it was interesting. They put it in public space, um, and they broadcast these messages during a time of great contention and uncertainty. And the AIDS quilt is another example um, of how people coming together um, and creating different media and connecting that together in, in physical public space um, became a way um, through remix culture, through mashups, um, to, to shift narratives and show cultural values. Um, I see Claire Water here. And um, I love uh, the report from Council that um, she and Hossein Darakshan put together for Council of Europe. Um, because you know, so, so this, in this time that we're in, we're so focused on disinformation and what is so disempowering about this moment. But I, I really especially like this passage is that we need to fight rumors and conspiracy when engaging in parallel narratives that leverage the same techniques as disinformation. Some of these might include provoking emotions, repetition, a strong visual aspect, a powerful narrative. When I saw this, I said, this is so much of meme culture. This is so much of internet culture. These are some of the ingredients that activists have been using um, for, um, for a very long time. And indeed, blending the physical and the digital. Um, Gisela Perez de Aches, a lawyer and activist who I interviewed in Mexico, and she wrote about this, about their, the activism around the disappeared students in Mexico. We need visual and strong messages, visual and strong messages, things that just get through to your soul. I think art is a very powerful tool of change. And this uh, fue el estado, um, it means it was a state. And it was, it was a narrative that, um, that activists in Mexico injected through hashtag culture, through literal, the literal plaza um, of the Zocalo in Mexico City that shaped a discourse around who was at fault for the, for the disappeared students. And so in the book, I, I write about this, the digital plaza, um, that you have the physical, you have physical spaces and you have digital spaces. So many movements that are engaging in, in hashtag and meme activism are combining the physical and the digital. Um, and when you think about, um, you know, we often think of the internet as kind of the digital public sphere, the digital public space. But when you look at actual digital pub, uh, actual public spaces, they're historic sites of contention and protest, the Zocalo, Tiananmen Square, National Mall. These are places of both violence and resistance, places where people inject symbols, um, where people um, try to shape national narratives. Um, and just as different physical public spaces contain different politics, so do our different digital ones. Um, when you start traveling around, experiencing different internets, different internet spaces, and different physical spaces, they all have a politics. And it's important to understand how memes are engaging with those politics. So just to close, uh, you know, when the internet we're becoming more aware of the internet. We said, oh, great. Um, this is going to increase more voices. We're going to have a lot, of, a lot of new voices coming to the table. And um, that's been true. Um, we have many different voices, many different forms of expression. Um, uh, but uh, the challenge now is that um, you know, in these spaces, with attention economics, with how these digital plazas optimize for certain types of expression, is that the loudest voices are winning. 
And it's part of this larger shift um, Penny Andrews has written about um, is that we're moving from a world of consensus. Um, we had the post-war consensus and the liberal consensus. We can debate whether either even was consensus, but that consensus, at least, was enabled by broadcast media, the, the sense that, OK, we all agree on these, these, these common things. Um, and they wrote that they we're now entering what um, could be called digital dissensus. Um, we're quick to jump to outrage, fragmented in echo chambers. Meme culture is central to this. And Whitney Phillips, who I just have to quote again, wrote recently in Neiman Lab is that there's, you know, these days it's too much harassment, too many memes, um, spreading too quickly with too little oversight or editorial restraint. Um, this world of dissensus, um, this world of contention um, is being played out through meme culture. It's an expression of how the systems function. And act, both activists, propagandists, agents of disinformation, politicians, people in power are all um, expressing their contention through the way that works on the internet. Um, and in this context, those with more access to power inevitably are going to win. And it is not just about the fragmentation of internet communities, it's about the fragmentation of the internet itself. Uh, Sean McDonald and I have written about this in foreign policy, this notion of the digital politic that is happening now. The internet itself is fragmenting, and um, the, the, the vision of the internet is being pushed both by China, by the United States, by Europe, but also by many other countries. States are enacting um, their vision of the world through the internet. Um, and meme culture is having to contend with this, um, just as the internet itself is, is starting to fracture and uh, become its own site of contention. So I have to bring it back to animals. Um, this was a map um, of animals of the world um, that the Civic Beat um, a Research Collective I started with Jason Lee, we made for the Museum of the Moving Image. And the show was called um, How Cats Took Over the Internet. And the reason we made this map was part of the larger deconstruction of the exhibition was cats did not take over the internet. Um, in fact, um, when you started asking researchers about the prototypical animals around the world, um, they started talking about goats, um, llamas, bears, um, donkeys, um, other sorts of creatures. Um, and this is kind of a fun, engaging way to talk about this world of dissensus, that the internet has made room for more voices, um, more forms of expression. And through the silly approach, the meme mask is asking a serious question. How can discussions of internet culture be grounded in the specificity of lived experiences? Um, donkeys in Tajikistan is not an accident because donkey humor um, has long been a part of, of uh, Tajiki culture. Um, how do we bring a cultural perspective to a space historically understood as one predominantly about information and technology, but is in many ways um, about cultural expression? And how can we engender these conversations in a way with the general public that's both enriching and engaging? Um, we want to do more of this map, so if you have other animals who want to contribute. But the larger purpose here um, is to show the diversity of the internet through ostensibly silly things, um, because that plays out in the very, very serious as well. So I'll close with one of the closing passages of my book. And um, 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 I'm, I, sh I should probably, you know, I should perform this by actually reading from the book, but this is, um, I'll just read from the slides. We've entered a new world of mimetic contention, um, one where meme culture has become as much a tool for those in power as it has for those seeking to challenge it. Movements of hate have embraced meme culture just as much as movements of justice. Um, and in fact, these movements are learning and co-opting from each other, borrowing each other's techniques because they're learning how to influence society. Internet culture and offline culture are intertwined. Internet culture is in fact culture. And what happens online influences culture at large in both subtle and compelling ways. And so in a world where people have a vehicle by which to, more people have a vehicle by which to express their views, social movements must navigate this new world of dissensus, of disagreement, of cultural values being expressed through different communities and coming from different deep stories. And how they negotiate this contention and how we as researchers, people building the internet, as journalists, how all of us negotiate this contention and think about new structures for the internet um, is, I think, one of the vital questions of the 21st century. And so I hope we can keep the joy of the internet um, while also understanding the very serious implications of how we communicate today. Thank you. Okay. So wasn't that awesome, right? Like, this is just fantastic. So luckily, you have two ways to proceed. I'm going to first remind you of your role here, which is that after we're done with the Q&A, your role is to proceed by learning more through the book, which you will buy. But your other way is to ask questions. This is an opportunity, since you're here in person, to learn more about things you want to know. So who's first? Who has a question that they're dying to ask? All right. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Pinate. I'm a grad student at Rutgers University. Hi. Um, I think the thing I find really fascinating about 
the politics of memes is the way that people understand them as apolitical. Yeah. And so it's like this crashing together of like people insisting that memes are silly and yet distinctly they're not. And so I wonder how do you think about the way people understand the memes themselves and then like how they're talking past each other in terms of the way they're using them in that way, right? So like, mm -hmm. is it the case that the cat meme has created an assumption that memes are this frivolous thing that has allowed people to co-opt them in these sort of insidious ways or, I, yeah, I just wanted. Yeah, it's an interesting way. I think so. in so many ways, uh, the frivolousness, you know, um, I think the discourse around memes has changed over the past year, but the historic way that we saw memes as frivolous opened, um, created a vacuum. Um, a kind of media vacuum that enabled um, uh, uh, people like who um, uh, d realized its power, um, whether they're, they're governments, hate groups, um, propagandists, um, and, and activists, um, to utilize that same meme culture, um, whether it's literally cats or, or, or just the same dynamics, um, to, to shape discourse. And so, um, so I think that's an interesting tension um, there. And, and I do think it's changing now. Um, I think, um, I think one, of, one of the interesting things about the midterms, the 2016 election, um, is the recognition that that memes have this kind of power, um, but it can it's still I think there still needs to be more research into what exactly is happening, how that power is being expressed, how what is the influence of these types of media, um, but I think what's what's increasingly clear is that what we used to dismiss as frivolous um, is is in fact um, uh, one of the most um, powerful forms of media expression right now. Hi, thank you. I'm Sarita, um, Data and Society. My question is about pleasure. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the uh, way that people take pleasure in creating and then yeah. circulating and also recognizing different memes and how that works with this model of the census or the larger kind of political landscape that you're pointing out. Yeah, yeah. I think pleasure is complex, right? You can take pleasure in um, uh, building community um, around marginalized communities, but you can also take pleasure in, in harming communities as well. Um, but I think uh, feelings, um, and, um, and I skimmed over this, but the feels, the internet is a place of feels. Um, I think it's, it's often overlooked in our studies of how um, uh, meme culture um, and internet culture more largely has impacts in society and that people take pleasure in, in meme culture, that it, it's an, in often ways an enjoyable thing. Um, and uh, that can be extremely constructive or destructive, just like pleasure in offline life. Um, and so, um, uh, so every, you know, when I interviewed so many people who were participating in this, I'll share one anecdote. Um, it's a meme I didn't cover here, but I have a paper about this, um, about um, people participating in a meme for a blind Chinese activist, Chen Guangcheng, um, who has disappeared. And people would post memes about him. And uh, um, this was encouraged by one particular artist whose name was Crazy Crab. And one of the things that he said to me was he encouraged this meme culture about a disappeared artist, um, a lawyer, um, because of the fear, the tremendous fear that people feel when they see that someone has business appeared. And so that pleasure itself became political because it became a way of dispelling the fear. Um, so, um, so I think it's, it's absolutely central to how meme culture operates. Hello, Anne. My name is Andrew, and I'm a student. I'm an undergrad student at Pace University. Okay. So I have a question. I actually did um, a paper on the umbrella movement and the Tiananmen movement this past semester. Oh, you did? Oh, well. Yeah. And, um, I saw a I saw a video of Joshua Wong being interviewed, mm -hmm. and the reporter said that Xi Jinping is is actually promote um, promoting democracy democracy, but within the, but within the Chinese context. Yeah. So, what is your understanding of what Xi Jinping said, and how is he using that um, through the internet? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, one of um, uh, it's not quite a meme, but um, Xi Jinping put out these kind of new socialist values um, uh, for Chinese society. Um, and one of them was, uh, interestingly, democracy. Um, and so um, I think what's, um, the, what we're seeing with the power of, of Xi Jinping's and, and the, the party's control over discourse in general is that you can enable certain forms of discussion. And um, um, I, uh, there's a chapter in my book around, around pollution. Um, was an incredibly censored um, uh, discussion in China until recently. Now everyone can talk about pollution. But because of the precision around censorship, the precision around narrative control, um, the discussion around pollution is just the fact that pollution is happening and not its sources and not its origins. Um, and so I think, um, I think uh, one of the, the complex things about, about um, democracy here um, is in some ways it's, it's, it's classic doublespeak, right? Um, and, uh, but, but because of the precision around 
both censorship and the ability to shape narrative discourse through paid commentators, um, uh, the, the scope of that discourse um, can, be, can be limited, so, yeah. Uh, hi, <clears throat> sorry, hi, my name is Dave Algoso. I'm a consultant with social change organizations. Um, I noticed you didn't speak much about any particular platforms or apps and Twitter yeah. versus Reddit or things. Right. Maybe that's something covered in the book it and is. just be curious for um, some of the ideas, uh, what you saw in terms of how uh, different memes spread on different platforms and how the platforms themselves maybe have responded to this culture and, and changed in response. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, it is something I go into more in the book and that's part of the concept of the digital plaza is that um, um, in addition to the kind of, when I say digital places have politics, it's the platforms and um, countries enact their politics on, on those platforms. And so, um, uh, so, uh, so I do go into that in the book, and I, I think there, there are different ways to think about platforms. Um, uh, Kat Lowe has uh, written about this, that um, you have forum-based um, platforms, um, the, the Reddits and the 4chans of the world you have, um, which can create communities of affiliation by topic. Um, you have algorithmic um, feed excuse me, feed-based platforms where you may not have control over what you see, and so therefore that what the messages that come through um, are um, often optimized for attention. And, um, and, then, and then you have private messaging apps. I think that's a, um, a kind of these closed messaging spaces. And, and memes um, as street art um, on digital spaces adapt for these different techniques. And so um, within foreign-based culture, memes, um, you're often seeing iter quick iteration, people um, building around um, topical um, points of interest. Um, and then that becomes a place to perfect uh, memes. And uh, Claire, uh, Claire's also just written about this with kind of a trumpet of attention um, through a process called intentional overproduction, the ability to quickly remix and, and refine. It's a, um, and, then, um, and then test that in, in, in more algorithmic feeds. And so um, the meme dynamics are different, um, but the, the under, underlying dynamics of most platforms right now is attention uh, um, economics. And so uh, for the most part, memes are optimizing for a certain kind of a mode of attention. Uh, thank you for your talk on. Um, so recently there has been a rash of Bird Box memes, which is a new Netflix movie. <laughs> yes. And uh, I think this is one of the big first examples in the US that we've seen of a private company really throwing a lot of money at sort of taking over the memetic space. Yep. And do you view that as a threat or uh, are, there other, are there examples of this that you may have seen in other countries? Um, so I, I try to look, um, you know, I, I think there, there is, what I talk about in the book is that ultimately meme culture, um, if we accept that things don't magically go viral, um, that they're built very intentionally, but through specific techniques, um, uh, the, right now, um, because we don't have any frameworks um, that, that help uh, uplift uh, marginalized voices, is that ultimately over time, um, the memes that will dominate discourse are going to become from those with the most resources and power. Um, and so Netflix, the fact that Netflix is able to engender uh, memes, right, um, shouldn't be a surprise to us um, because states are also doing the same. Um, and so um, is it a threat? Um, um, I think if, if it's a threat to, um, to kind of democratic discourse, to, to diversity of voices, um, because um, as meme culture becomes professionalized and these techniques are understood, um, uh, yeah, we should see more, we should see um, things optimized for people who have money and power. On the other hand, um, you can also learn from this, right? I think, again, this, this notion of ephemerality, the, the clapback, is that um, by studying how these things spread, um, and a lot of why I look in the book specifically just at, at case studies, and I look at um, why um, certain memes take off and what are the factors in them, um, uh, people in marginalized communities um, can also take advantage of the, those same powers. Um, hey, Anne, how you hey. doing? Hey, hey well. um, my name's Paul Miller, uh, aka DJ Spooky. Hey. Um, I had a quick question, which I guess I wanted to ask about just some of the issues around um, the way you see the near future. I mean, obviously, um, if you look at China or Russia or other countries that are forcing uh, companies to move their servers directly in the country, um, you're getting to the rise of what they call the sovereign uh, web in those specific regions. Um, one of my uh, favorite quotes around this right now is um, Frederick Jameson, where he says, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Um, and as everyone's been using the term late capitalism so much, what do you think, um, considering how monetized these things are, um, what do you think is going to be maybe the next five years of this? Like it's, most people have been asking about a little bit in the rear view mirror, but I wanted to just hear what your yeah. thoughts are on the next probably five years or so. Um, yeah, just, just was curious. There's a Freedom House report that everyone should read about the rise of digital authoritarianism. Um, and I, I dive much more into Chinese censorship mechanisms in the book. Um, but the thing I want to emphasize is that this misinformation crisis we're um, experiencing right now 
um, the uh, all the, the memes that are being associated with disinformation um, and um, and misinformation, malinformation, um, are being used as uh, rhetoric um, to to justify an authoritarian model of controlling the internet. And so we're stuck between two models of the internet right now, arguably maybe three um, dominant ones. We have the kind of Silicon Valley laissez-faire model, um, which is optimized for attention and uh, you know people with resources shouting the loudest. And then the Chinese authoritarian model, um, which is um, uh, designed for um, as much state control as possible. And that model is not abstractly just Chinese. It is literally being exported to places like Venezuela, um, Iran, um, and Vietnam. And so the state we're at in the internet is that um, it is being played out through politics and power. Um, the vision of the internet um, is, um, is being shaped um, by governments um, and by um, corporations. Um, and without a framework, a democratic framework, for, um, for shaping the internet, for defining how the internet works, um, I expect that um, things will just optimize more for the state and more for corporations than for um, a democracy. Hi, I'm Jake from Data and Society. Um, I, can you talk a little bit about your tools of the trade? Like, how do you find a meme and track its history? Yeah. And just like, what's your method for methods? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gathering information, processing yeah. it. Yeah. Um, a lot of my work um, is is much more qualitative um, than I, I think. There's a lot of uh, folks in this room who, um, and starting to work with a group called Pulsar Platform, who can like you know you can pull up memes and start to look in a very quantitative way. Um, but um, my method typically is actually sitting down with movements, interviewing them, um, looking at the memes they're sharing, um, and then doing cultural analysis um, on it in the same way. Because uh, a, a lot of some of my background is in art, arts and art history. And so I'll look at it through, through the lens of media, of media studies um, and, and, what, what, um, and what is the media, broader media discourse there. Um, so that's, that's my dominant framework. Um, and uh, um, at Medan, we're starting to, to look at this in quantitative ways. Um, we're building tools for analyzing and annotating digital content and building databases for that. Um, but my, my, my personal background um, is very much in, um, in media studies and ethnographies. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Ellery. I work with Global Voices. I wanted to know if you could just say something about um, the the sort of who makes memes and the ownership versus the sh sort of sharing and stuff yeah. moving around and getting yeah. built on and built on. Um, and I ask this kind of from the point of view of somebody who's Im embedded in a lot of different activist networks where people are trying to put something out there and there'll be like a lot of infighting about yeah. what to make it look like and what's the hashtag and that sort of thing. And then, and then kind of who owns it who gets to decide? But then, yeah. once you guys release it, it's like off once it goes. It's out, it's you know, out. Yeah. I just, I'm, I yeah. just love to hear you riff yeah. on that. Sure. Yeah. There, there's a tension actually. But it's interesting. It's kind of a cultural or generational tension, um, because historically, you know, the, the idea of owning media, right, is itself a kind of historic accident, right? It's a, it's, it's kind of recent invention um, in the West that, that you can own something and you can own intellectual property. And so much of meme culture um, is actually not about ownership. It's about it's focused more on remix and participation. It looks more like discourse um, uh, than through media rather than kind of owning and creating. And so there's this tension there in terms of who owns it. Most meme creators I, I've spoken with don't think of themselves as owning the thing, uh, but maybe originators, inspirers, um, and are often thrilled to see something remixed. Um, uh, the, the flip side, though, um, and where where you saw this tension was with the Pepe memes. Um, the owner of Pepe, Matt Fury, um, was uh, furious um, to see it uh, being co-opted. I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a meme writer. Um, <laughs> um, to see it being co-opted and then used legal mechanisms to, to try to stop its co-optation. And so that's a tension that we're seeing. Um, a kind of, and, and I think it's more cultural than legal, um, but it's an attitude towards media that, um, that we're, we're seeing play out um, both with kind of commercial content but also with activist content. Snaps too. It's on for her fantastic work. 